Hello, Assalamu alaikum, namaste, sastriyakal, assalamu alaikum. My name is Fahim Khan and you're watching the Aziza Show. Today we're actually going to talk about women in leadership. And with me are my guests, Agapi Jassasi, Saima Malik, and Sadaf Pervez. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. So I um, want to just sort of jump right into it. So what, you know, um, did you all, you've, you've all have very different positions that you sort of hold within, you know, society and community. You, can you tell us a little bit about who you are so our audience knows? You want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, so Simon Malik, I have over 18 years of experience in the digital and tech space. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had sort of various different roles, starting in consulting and working for other technology companies. I currently work for a bank right now in the digital space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also really, really passionate about women in leadership and women in tech, and also feel, uh, considering the experience that I have, um, that I really want to give back. And so I do that through a number of organizations where I not only mentor mm -hmm. uh, young women, but I also uh, have um, uh, recently starting up a program that actually helps build that leadership capacity specifically for Muslim women. Wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Welcome. Uh, so Sadaf Parvez, I, I have been at a professional services firm here on Bay Street for the last 15 years, but my career has been varied. Uh, it started out in the auditing space, so I'm a CA by background, but now I'm a director of diversity and inclusion. So mm -hmm. my day job is actually around ensuring equity for the people that work in our organization right. uh, and uh, ensuring that women in particular, but also uh, any sort of marginalized group has equitable access to leadership opportunities and that the systemic barriers within the organization have been addressed as well. Mm -hmm. So um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Same. So I work as an executive director at an organization that helps young people uh, get into fields and training in gaps in the labor market. So the trades, um, mm -hmm. digital tech, um, kitchen type of jobs. And so I've done that, that for a number of years mm -hmm. and uh, I <coughs> was an ED at another organization but I've really started my career in the social service sector mm -hmm. and I've built that as frontline worker and moved on mm -hmm. um, obviously to, to reach where I am but I'm extremely passionate about seeing young people's lives change. I work specifically with young people mm -hmm. um, and women uh, in that space as well is um, very important to me that they feel empowered to do what they, they want to do and um, that we can empower them to do that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, everybody has a journey and, you know, there's a path that we all take and sometimes we think we know where we're going and we end up somewhere else and sometimes, you know, we know where we're going and we end up where we want to. So, so Simo, tell us about your story. Did you always know that you wanted to actually be in the digital space? Um, no, actually, uh, my background, I graduated from university with an accounting degree. Okay. Um, and I actually kind of accidentally fell into an opportunity to intern at a consulting agency okay. uh, company. And, um, you know, after I had a little sort of snippet of that space, it was, you know, I wasn't going back. Um, the numbers were not for me. Um, and I was just really excited about all these new opportunities that were happening with the internet and e-commerce. Right. Um, and that journey um, has continued with me and evolved in lots of different capacities, right. um, starting at sort of the bottom and doing the work to now as a leader and setting strategy and uh, helping support the bank and in, in, in all the work they're doing in the digital space and transformation. So it's definitely been an evolution as a leader right. um, and starting from the bottom. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. Wonderful. Yeah. What about you, Salaf? Uh Yeah, so for me, um, I started out in the auditing space uh, mm -hmm. and I graduated with an accounting degree as well. But, um, you know, four or five years in, uh, I was given an opportunity to cover a mat leave position. And I thought I was mm -hmm. only going to cover the maternity leave and go back to my auditor role. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I've always been passionate about women and women's uh, development. And most big organizations nowadays have these employee networks. So mm -hmm. I was par already part of like the professional women's network at my company. And, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I'm, I don't have an HR background. I've never done anything in the space. How? Why would I be qualified? And I think, um, you know, I had people around me that pushed me and said, "Yeah, but you have the right skill set. And even if though you don't have the, the technical training, you know, the HR background, right, you have right. the passion for it." Right. And so I did it for the one year mat leave and fell in love with the role. And my career took a totally different twist. Mm -hmm. And I've been in this space, the the diversity and space ever since. And uh, and so my dad always says, "Well, why'd you do your CA?" But if I hadn't gotten that yeah. CA and I wasn't 
you know, there at, at the right time, I would right. never have been given this opportunity. For sure. So um, For sure. in that sense, it has opened a lot of doors. Amazing. Yeah. That's great. That's a, uh, it's interesting because I always was taught as a young person, my parents would say, oh, well, if you want to help people, there's no money in that. So like, just put that aside. <laughs> um, and so my first job, my first like full time salary job was actually at a bank. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to help people become financially free. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> what I'm going to do. Uh, silly me. Yeah. <laughs> but I would always after work, I used to call it my five to nine job. I'd always volunteer and I'd always go mm -hmm. and and give back to community because that's where my heart was but I was like it's not really a viable option mm -hmm. um, or I didn't see it at the time but I actually entered into a program that United Way had yes. called City Leaders which is um, kind of how we and Farheen yes, know each other right. and I think that really opened my eyes because I had never really knew what the United Way de did and I never thought of the social service sector on that scale mm -hmm. I always just thought very grassroots and I went there and there are people who are directors and VPs and they look well to do to me. Right. <laughs> and so through that program, I discovered, oh no, this is actually, a, I could actually make a living off of, right. off of doing my passion. And so right. I kind of traded and flipped it and made my, you know, my five to nine job, my nine to five, oh, not so cool. much my nine to five, but <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how I fell into it. It was always been my passion. Very cool. Well, I think, I mean, for me, like I, I, my thing was, was that, you know, when I was growing, I had started, I had, sorry, I, used to, I had to start working very young. So I was 16 when I started working full time because I needed to help my family financially. And so, you know, when I was younger, I was like, okay, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a journalist or I'm going to be, you know, mm -hmm. a, a school teacher or something. Right. And when it actually came down to it, I was like, okay, well, you know, I have to make that decision to say, okay, well, I can't currently go to to, to the type of job that I want, or I can't pursue my post-secondary education, so I need to actually put that aside, start working sort of the, you know, nine to five, so to right. speak, call center type job, mm -hmm. so that I can just, you know, make ends meet, and then slowly build up to, you know, what I need to do. So, mm -hmm. um, and then for me, like, that's what sort of took me on this whole different path, because I was in the call center, just another agent like everybody else, suddenly somebody saw something in me, and then I started to move up the ladder. I got into corporate communications, and then realized, like you, that there mm -hmm. was some, you know, viable options in the not-for-profit side of things, because I was dealing with some health issues and after 9-11 I was attacked so physically for me it was like okay well I was dealing with a lot of emotional stuff yeah. too and it's like how do I sort of marry my work in terms of corporate communications and marketing into something that actually supports women that have dealt with some of these issues right so that's kind of how I shifted into not-for-profit mm -hmm. and so I've been there since so it's very interesting right but I, I know personally like the kinds of challenges I've had to deal with so what sorts of challenges have you you know uh, as women sort of coming into these positions of leadership had to had to deal with um, I mean, one, you know, sometimes there's these informal networks that you need to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, unfortunately, some of them are systematic, uh, you know, things like the old boys network or, um, you know, um, accessing certain opportunities because you sort of don't uh, a friend of a friend and that's how you access those types of things. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, those are some of the things um, and the glass ceiling still definitely exists. Sure. Um, so it's not like it's gone away. I think the the opportunity that you have though um, in is, uh, is is working through some of those things systematically in the organization that you're in um, through some you know through the programs that Sedef has at her program and I, I actively participate uh, for the organization that I work with and they're able to transform not only some of those systematic components but the most important is the mindset and the culture. And so I think there's an, you know, there's an opportunity there, but I also think as you move up the ladder and you're a woman, you really have an opportunity to influence uh, given sort of the, the position you're in. And I think we really need to harness that and take advantage of that. So I'm also a really big believer of, you know, mobilizing leader of leaders uh, among women um, to help sort of bridge that network and make some of those changes collectively, whether it's in corporate or community. I mean, I've had the opportunity to even coach uh, women who are really high performers at my organization. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things through my coaching and through some of the programs we deliver that we see is we, you know, 
studies have shown that women are over mentored and under sponsored mm -hmm. so a lot of times women think they have people who have their back mm -hmm. who are going to go to bat for them who are going to advocate for them but they're you know and I'm not saying it's not good to have mentors mm -hmm. uh, obviously mentors are there to sure. support you when you're having a bad day or like help you with career advice mm -hmm. they can be internal or external to the organization but within your organization for your own career it's really important and I try to tell people um, to be mindful about their career and mm -hmm. And figure out who is sponsoring them um, and so by sponsor for those who don't really know the difference between sponsorship and mentorship mm -hmm. sponsorship is people who stand in front of you mentors will stand beside mm -hmm. you right yes, so yes. this is someone who's literally willing to you know you know put their name beside your name uh, right. for a promotion um, so like for example at our organization there's a partnership evaluation right and mm -hmm. um, someone literally has to sign a form that says I think this person is worthy of being a partner mm -hmm. at this organization. I'm so, going to stop you right there sorry we're going to take a quick break and I want to continue this conversation okay we'll be back in a minute. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Aziza Show. We were just talking to Sadaf, so if you were talking about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Yeah, and I think so, a lot of times, um, you know, I can remember I just did a session where I asked everyone in the room to put their hand up who thought they have a uh, sponsor. And, mm -hmm. you know, 90% of the people in the room put their hand up. And then when I described the difference between mentor and sponsor and said, now, how many people think they have a sponsor? most of those hands went down. Right. So um, so for women in particular, the, the, the importance of having a sponsor is important because a lot of times women are put on a path that is a little bit more, um, you know, internal roles, um, not the biggest accounts uh, or clients mm -hmm. of the organization. And once you're on that path, it doesn't lead to moving up the ranks because you do need to have public company experience, for example, in our organization, or you need to have worked on a prospectus, or, you, you know, there's certain characteristics that no matter how good a worker you are if you don't have those in your you know in your uh, portfolio or in your background mm -hmm. it just that glass ceiling comes quick right. um, so a sponsor is someone who will say no Saima has like the ability to manage this client and I'm gonna put her on that client right. so that that you know she's on the level playing field and when promotion time comes up and Saima and Sam let's say are mm -hmm. being considered we can say Sam has also worked on a public company. You know, it's, that's right. not going to hold her back from the promotion. Right. So, so if, that's what I've seen time and time again is that women need to really determine whether they have a sponsor and how and navigate to get a sponsor by, you know, really doing good work and figuring out, you know, who has the political capital that and someone that. And um, do you think a lot of organizations are willing to do that? Like to, to be like or individuals who would be willing to do, become sponsors? Yeah, maybe like some. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are. Um, I think that you definitely, from experience I can speak, you actually have to make people aware of the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to be really, really comfortable about uh, talking about the work you do right. and, uh, you know, um, essentially, you know, letting people know all the great work you do. So sometimes we kind of go ahead and just get the work done and it's yeah. a very sort of female sort of crate to just say good hard work counts. But guess right. what? You actually have to talk about it. You have to showcase it. You have to go make sure the right people know the work that you've been doing. Because right. um, you may have end up in a situation where you're doing really great work but no one knows about it. So right. it's really important um, in an organization in order to build sponsorship and mentorship to mm -hmm. actually essentially build a sell sheet and sort of make sure that you're talking about the work you do right. and that you that's how you gain sponsorship and mentorship. But I think right. that yeah. Muslim women and a lot of Muslim women that I mentor have said, mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, our religion talks about being humble and mm -hmm. like it feels inauthentic to be basically bragging about myself like look what I did here mm -hmm. yesterday and I ran this panel the other day. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's also being sensitive to um, having the organization understand that there may be some hidden gems. I, mm -hmm. I feel like it's like a two-way street. I don't always feel like the women have to do all the work. Right. I think there's now to, to culture change like when mm -hmm. we're in a position of influence we should start asking people to consider not the usual suspects. Right. Did you consider you know someone who isn't a braggart but has done the work right. um, so starting to push the envelope there because right. a lot of times um, it's not comfortable for people and mm -hmm. we do need to do our part on getting more comfortable of doing it in a, a less bragging way if, if I can say that but still you know uh, make make it aware that you're ambitious and you do yeah. want to work on big cl clients and things like that mm -hmm. um, without feeling like you're being cheesy or you know 
It's true, although the only comment I'd say is that I think sometimes uh, it comes really easily to, to, to some of the guys mm -hmm. where yeah, females right. sort of tend to stay, stay back. Mm -hmm. So it's finding that balance uh, even as a female. Yeah, I would even say just as a woman of color in leadership, what I've struggled with, especially in my, you know, I think I, the first time I was in ED, I think I was 26 years old. So like entering into that realm, it was mm -hmm. very intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, and I entered into a field that was predominantly, um, it was a charity that helped young um, people break into the media and film industry, mm -hmm. but you dealt with media and film industry people. Yeah, right. And I came from like airy fairy, like, oh, let's, hold hands and kumbaya, like feeling safe space. And that was not the case when I arrived. And so um, for me, I struggled with, well, I can't be too assertive mm -hmm. because then they're gonna be like angry black woman syndrome, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, but I also have to, I won't be bullied, right? right? And so that was a really big challenge for me on how I can, how I could voice um, what I brought to the table because a lot of the times, sometimes my work would be discredited or, mm -hmm. Um, okay, that's nice, but, you know, and it's just like, well, what I just did, like, mm -hmm. saved us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to find my voice in that and say, mm -hmm. like, well, this is, this is what we had before. Mm -hmm. this, is what we, this is what I've brought to the table. Right. And like subtly, like you yes. said, it, yeah. it let people know, mm -hmm. you know, this was a gap that, was, that has now been filled That's and right. it has been filled by me. Right. We could move on to yes. other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think the subtlety in it mm -hmm. is important. And I think um, women, definitely, we need to start to speak to those things mm -hmm. because the modesty is one thing, but when our male counterparts are much louder and it comes naturally to them, mm -hmm. um, it, you'll be left in the shadow for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm a mom of three, um, and so we made some choices in the beginning to have sort of paid help, I'd say, um, and we needed to do that because uh, I really enjoyed working and I didn't want to stay home, quote unquote. Um, those are the choices that I made, but I also, you know, we, I did have a lot of family support, so my parents helped us out quite a bit. Um, but I also want to be cognizant that there, you know, um, there are other um, single moms out there, um, you know, single dads out there who don't really have those type of support mechanisms. Sure. Um, so I think we're very, very fortunate to have those, but uh, you have to be aware that it's not available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, items like flex work help a lot in accommodating uh, and adjusting for uh, more of, you know, childcare or elder care but um yeah i just think it's, it's important to consider those factors also well i don't um have a family as of yet uh <laughs> but i will say that i mean i think the driving force for me in anything that i do is my mother passed away when i was 14 years old and so that was like a really big turning point for me in life and i think in everything that i do i think like okay I always tell people sometimes like they're like, oh, carry these boxes. I'm like, my mother didn't come to the country for me to do that. That's, you know, that's, that's where you need to do that for me. Um, but I think that that's like a driving force for me and my siblings and mm -hmm. my, um, you know, the, the friends that I have around me are all really supportive in the things that I do. Um, and I think that I've I, I created a support system around me of people mm -hmm. who are like minded. A lot of people. Uh, just so happen to be in the same industry a lot of the time mm -hmm. um, and so those are people that I can pull on and right. and ask for for help right. when need be right. but also just like my nieces like hanging out with them gives me like balance and right. um, and gives me like that sense of community yeah. or family okay well thank you so much for you know to all of you for being here it was yeah. a pleasure to have a conversation thank you. i wish we had more time yes um so until next week um we'll see you then take care